Good morning. So glad that you're here with us on campus. Glad that you're joining us online wherever you may be. We get to worship together, study God's Word together, and all on Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day, moms, grandmoms out there. You know, some of the things that we do in life feel pretty natural to us. They, they just kind of happen second nature, or, or maybe it was a little bit awkward at first, but, you know, we got better and better as we practiced and tried, and, and, uh, and, and some people might be better than me at it, right? But it still feels pretty natural and pretty normal. There are other things that feel completely unnatural, right? And, and I got to think that no matter how many times you do it, it's always going to feel unnatural. A great example is this insane practice or activity called wingsuit gliding, right? If you're not familiar, we'll just show you a few, about 10 seconds of this, uh, of this. couldn't really see my face in that video, <laughs> but I'm glad I did it, tried, tried it at least. You know, uh, you, you see that and you're like, how did someone come up with that? Like, I'm pretty sure they, they were walking through the forest and came across a flying squirrel and we're like, you know what? I got an idea. I think we could do this, right? It's, that's just insane. It's crazy that someone would even try that. It's unnatural. Now, a more tame, less life-threatening, but still unnatural activity that we all engage in from time to time is the act of forgiving. Forgiving is one of those abilities that is unique to humanity in, in, in all of creation. Like if you go to Africa and you're on safari and you see a, a lion attack a gazelle, right? And it's dying breath, that gazelle does not say, I forgive you. And even if it did, the lion would not care because... The lion cannot receive forgiveness, so that just does not happen in nature. This is something that only humans have, that we're the only creatures on earth that have this capacity to give and receive forgiveness. And, and we have this unique capacity because we are uniquely created in the image of God. And God is a supremely forgiving God. And so as, as we bear his image, he has given to us, he has planted that capacity into our hearts and into our minds. But as is so much the case with, with uh, or as is the case with so much of what God has given us, our sinfulness and the brokenness of this world has, has distorted and twisted our ability to forgive. And so forgiving is an unnatural activity for us. It's hard for us to figure out. It's hard for us to do it well. And maybe the reason that the topic of forgiveness came up in different ways several times in the questions that we were given, the questions that people are asking and, and wanting to, to explore. And so we want to try to answer the question today, how does this forgiveness thing work, right? And we'll talk about some, some, some big picture forgiveness of God, but then also some specific questions uh, that were given of, this, man, how does it work in this scenario? Or what about this? How do we do that? Because rightly understanding forgiveness is essential for a right relationship with God and others. If we want to have the right relationship first with God, but then also with one another, we got to understand forgiveness and how, to, how it works and, and how do we do that. And so let's begin by just talking about God's forgiveness. We have the capacity to forgive because God gives us that. He bestows that on us, right? It comes from Him. It begins with Him. So let's see if we can understand a little bit more about his forgiveness. And the first thing we, I want us to think about this morning is why we need God's forgiveness in the first place. Right? He's the creator of all things. And so we need God's forgiveness, yes, because we do wrong things, but that's not really the, the foundation of it. We need God's forgiveness because our sin is a personal offense against him. It's a personal offense against him. He is the creator of all things. There is no one higher than him. He sits at the top of the mountain. And because of that, because of his position, whatever he says goes, period. No questions. 
So therefore, if we do violate any of his commands, then he responds as the highest authority. And he's, God's been clear that all of us have violated a, at least one or two of his commands. Right? Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Falling short means we've missed the mark. We, we have not met the bar or the expectation, which is complete, total obedience and faithfulness. So we've all fallen short of that. And because of that, we owe God a penalty, right? For the wages of sin is death. The penalty that we owe is our lives. King David of ancient Israel expressed this well in, in Psalm 51, this personal nature. He was responding. He, he had fallen short. He had sinned first with Bathsheba and then having her husband Uriah killed. And in his confession to God, he says this in verse 4 of, of Psalm 51, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are right in your verdict and just, justified when you judge. Right? You can hear the personal nature, the personal of nature of the offense between David and God here. He says against you because our sins create that personal offense against God. And it requires that penalty. This is different than just breaking a law or breaking a rule, right? That's impersonal. And if it was just about breaking rules, then we would break the rule, we would get the punishment, and then we would go on with our lives. Forgiveness would not even factor in if it was just about breaking rules. But we ask for God's forgiveness because of the personal offense, the personal nature of the, of the violation against God. It's like if, as a parent, if you... Uh, have some cash in your wallet. I rarely have cash in my wallet. Maybe they take your ATM card or whatnot. But if your child sneaks behind your back and they take a $20 bill out of your wallet, right? They broke a rule. They shouldn't do that. But the bigger offense is the personal nature of that, right? That they respected you so little in that moment as to take from you. That they loved you so little in that moment that they stole from you. Right? The personal hurt, the personal offense is far greater than just the rule that they broke. And God's forgiveness factors into this as he responds to that personal offense against him. Because at the top of the mountain, in his position as his highest person, any response he has to our sin, to that offense against him, any response is by default appropriate and just. Like there is no review board for God's decisions and what God and how God acts. There is no one to judge him. He sits at the top. And so any response that he has to our offense is justified. It is correct. And if God were not compassionate and loving and holy and merciful and gracious, then we would be in a whole lot of trouble. But he is compassionate. He is merciful. He is gracious, and he is the essence of love. And therefore, in his response, he has made forgiveness an option. He has made it possible for us. And that forgiveness is complete and full. When we look at verses like John 1, or 1 John 1, 9, he says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness doesn't say that he'll take it under consideration. He'll check the ledger balance, see if we have any forgiveness tokens left in our account. He says, if you confess, I will forgive you. And we flip over to Hebrews 7. Speaking of Jesus, he says, unlike the other high priests, that he does not need to, be, or need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Comparing Jesus to the Jewish high priest, and the Jewish priests would go, and they would daily make sacrifices, animal sacrifices for their own sins and for the sins of the people. And they did this daily because those animal sacrifices were inadequate. They did not match the offense between us and God. And so they had this, this you know, a patch of, of a sacrifice that they would make, but it said Jesus made an entirely different sacrifice. Remember that we need God's forgiveness because of the personal offense against him, along with violating the laws. But since Jesus is part of the triune God, that he and the Father are on equal standing, we have the offended party in Jesus, 
sacrificing for the offending party. The one who has been offended, the one who, who, who owe, is owed a debt, steps down to pay the debt that is owed to him. And so unlike the inadequate animal sacrifices, we have the extravagant sacrifice of Jesus that is more than enough to cover the debt of not just a few, but all people. And so God's forgiveness is complete. It is full. When we confess, because of the sacrifice of Jesus, all of our sins can be forgiven. And when we receive that, when we experience God's forgiveness, then we begin a new life and a new way of living. Because when we are forgiven like that, we cannot remain unchanged. It has to have a dramatic impact on us. And receiving and experiencing God's forgiveness in that way then gives us the privilege of living life as forgivers. Jesus had some clear and pretty strong words to talk and to say about forgiving others. For example, when he was teaching his disciples how to pray in Matthew 6, he included forgiveness. In verse 12, he says, uh, there, goodness. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus makes a direct connection between being forgiven and being a forgiver. Later on in Matthew chapter 18, he tells a parable about forgiveness, and we'll pick up in verse 23. But he says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, all right? That, that equals about 200,000 years worth of salary for an average worker, all right? That's a lot of money. So this guy owes 10,000 bags of gold. He was brought before the master. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will, I will pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. It's about a hundred days worth of salary. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. And when the master called the servant in, he said, You wicked servant, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy or forgiveness on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Again, Jesus draws this direct connection. You have been forgiven. You must forgive others. And he adds in that contrast between the, the, uh, the, the, the size of the debt that is owed, right? The astronomical debt that we owe God, that 10,000 bags of gold versus the offenses that we experience from others that may be legitimate. I mean, three months salary, not 100 day salary, that's a legitimate debt but it pales in comparison to what that first servant owed the master. And I would never diminish the debt, the offense, the hurt, the wrong that has been done to you. But I think we need to be honest and say that we all tend to diminish the debt that we owe God. We all tend to minimize our debt towards God. I'm like, ah, it wasn't that bad. I'm definitely not as bad as that guy back there, right? So, you know, there's that. We diminish what we owe God, but we hold others accountable, just like, just like the servant in the parable. So forgiving is not that easy for us. But because we've been forgiven so much, we need to learn how to, so, how to freely forgive others. And so we're, we're big fans of, of this, this uh, helpful framework, just as we encounter offenses, as people hurt us, as people do wrong things to us. How do we respond? How do I rightly respond in, to this person or to this situation? It's just four, four thoughts that it, it kind of walks us through. And the first one is about revenge, right? Revenge never, 
That we should never be taking revenge against those who have wronged us in some way or another. Now, revenge is not the same as justice. We're not saying there shouldn't be justice. Revenge is where I, the offended person, get back at you. Right? Justice is where those who are in authority address the matter. That they bring punishment. They, they bring the correct response to it. That's justice. But revenge is where I act on my own as the offended person, as the hurt person. And God's justice says that all evil will be settled. All evil, all wrongs will be accounted for. And that might happen on judgment day. And it might happen when the person who did wrong, who hurt you, confesses to Jesus. And they find repentance in him. But knowing that God will address all wrongs, either on judgment day or through the grace of Jesus... That empowers us to say, I, I don't need to take revenge on this. I don't need to get back at this person. Because I know one way or another, God will handle this. And if they find faith in Jesus, and, and then I can celebrate that because they've been forgiven just like I have. And we, can, and, and we can celebrate that in Jesus. So revenge never. Forgive always. When we've been hurt, when we've been offended when someone has done wrong, we forgive always. We've already discussed how you know, Jesus taught this. We can see in the Gospels his example of forgiveness. We read uh, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 32 earlier. You know, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Right? We have this clear call to be forgivers in life. Now, forgive, to forgive means that I will not hold this against you, and I will not use this against you. I'm not going to bring it up. I'm not going to harbor bitterness against you in my heart for this. And we say that we would forgive always in two regards. If that person comes to you in repentance, then there must be forgiveness extended. Because how has Christ forgiven us? When we repented, Christ, or God forgave us in Christ. Right? And, and it can be rightly said that God does not forgive everyone. He forgives those who repent. Those who turn to him in humble repentance are forgiven. And so when people come to us in repentance, then we must give what we have been given and forgive them. But what about those times where they don't repent or they can't? Maybe they passed away. Maybe they moved halfway around the world. You never see each other, right? There, there is no repentance how do we still, quote, forgive them? Well, we can forgive them in the sense of releasing that debt. That I, I, I don't have to carry that hurt. I don't have to carry that responsibility to hold them accountable. Because I know that God will, one way or another, either through the grace of Jesus or on Judgment Day. And because God has that handled I can forgive them. I can release that. I, can, I, I don't have to let that hurt and that anger and, and that injury live in my heart and in my mind because it will always turn to bitterness. And it will always cause me harm if I hold on to that, if I withhold that forgiveness. But I can release that and allow God to bring healing to that. So we can forgive always. And that, so not taking revenge, forgiving always, that's really one-sided, right? Someone, uh, I can do all that on my own without the other person being involved at all. But let's, let's bring both parties into the equation. And we would say that we're forgiving always, and we can reconcile usually. We can reconcile usually, right? And to reconcile means that uh, we're, uh, we can be at peace with one another, that there, there's not hostility between us. That when you see them at Walmart, you don't have to like yank the cart around and head down a different aisle. That you can, you can even you know, sit and worship together. That you can be at peace with one another. And we say that this should usually happen because it does take both sides. It takes two parties to reconcile. And so both have to work at this. But it should usually happen. Very few things should rise to the level of we cannot reconcile in this life. And then the last step would be restoration. Restoration sometimes. Restoration takes that reconciliation to the next level where it restores the relationship to the pre-offense status, right? We were best friends. 
and you said something that hurt my feelings, and I said something that hurt your feelings. We yelled at each other, but then we worked it out, and now we're best friends again, right? Children are amazing at this, right? They can be going at it, and then 30 seconds later, they're best friends again. To be fair, most of their offenses are pretty mild, right? As adults, we graduate to much worse hurt and offense towards one another, right? Adults can do some pretty terrible things to one another. And so we would say that restoration should sometimes happen because it's not always the right thing. It's not always the safe and healthy step to take. Sometimes offenses fall into categories that we would say, yeah, we can reconcile, we can be at peace, but that relationship cannot be restored, right? If, if, if the offense in, in involves abuse or infidelity or if it's addiction related, like it is not safe to restore that person in that relationship. And so you, you, you can reconcile, but we're going to have to go our separate ways. And that can be challenging to figure out. But this is our foundation of God's forgiveness and our forgiveness for one another. Right? How do we receive God's forgiveness? How do we uh, uh, give forgiveness to others? But let's think now about some of those, what about this kind of questions, right? And these are a little bit random. We're going to be jumping around. But I think these are really good questions for us to think about. First of all, and these are questions that people have asked us, is God's forgiveness dependent on me forgiving others? Right? Is, God, is God's forgiveness of me dependent on my forgiveness of others? And this comes from something that Jesus said uh, going back to Matthew 6. Right? We read verse 12 earlier, but then he says this in verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins... Your Father will not forgive you your sins. Now, at first glance, this seems to say that if, if, I, if I don't forgive someone, then I'm not going to be forgiven. God's not going to forgive me of my sin, right? Is that what that says? Is that what it means? Yes and no, all right? No in the sense that this is not talking about a salvation forgiveness. This is not talking about that forgiveness of our sins for salvation and eternal life. All right, so we're not talking about that, that level of forgiveness. In, in context, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray on a daily basis, right? He said in, in that prayer was, you know, give us this day our daily bread, not our annual bread or, you know, lifelong bread. Said, this is a daily context that Jesus is talking about. And so on this daily basis, even though we've been forgiven and we have eternal life and we're following Jesus, we still do wrong things. And that still creates offense between us and God and between one another. And so on a daily basis, as we are offending one another and, and, and we're offending God by our, our disobedience to him, that still has to be reconciled. That still has to be addressed, even though our salvation is secure through our faith in Jesus alone. And so he's saying, hey, as you go about your day and as you're messing everything up, Understand, if you want me, God's saying this, if you want me to address the issues between us, you've got to address the issues between you and others. And if you want me to restore that relationship between me and you, you have to restore that relationship. You have to deal with that offense between you and other people. And so we have this, it's, it's relational in nature as we're um, offending both God and one another through our, our hurts and our, the wrong things that we do. Second, another question here. Can Satan or evil spirits be forgiven? Now, just for a little background information, Satan and evil spirits were angels, created beings of God. They served him uh, until Satan, is also called Lucifer in the Bible, got the crazy idea that he wanted to take God's place. And so he rallied some, some other angels with him, and they tried to take over uh, God's place, God's spot. That didn't work out, and so God kicked them out of heaven sent them down. So now they, they are actively fighting against God, against God's will, against God's people here on this earth. We call them evil spirits or demons and, and Satan and so forth. And the person is saying, hey, can they be forgiven? And the, sh and the short answer is no, we don't think so. We really have no indication in the Bible that, that, ain't, that evil or, or, or fallen angels, evil spirits ever would seek forgiveness or could be forgiven. The Bible was, wit was written for humanity. It was written to people. And so it doesn't so much address the possibility of fallen angels being forgiven. The closest we come is the, to this topic is in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, where it says, Surely it is not angels that he, Jesus, helps, but Abraham's descendants. 
that what Jesus accomplished on the cross and in his resurrection really has no bearing on fallen angels because Jesus became one of us and died on the cross for us, for humanity. And so what he did has no relationship. It doesn't matter to the fallen angels. It doesn't apply to them. So as far as we can tell, no. Fallen angels cannot be forgiven and likely would probably not even seek forgiveness because that's part of their nature now. And then last question, what is the unforgivable sin? What is the unforgivable sin? Now, this is a great question, and I say that because I added it in here. Um, and it's, I think it's a great question because over the last specifically six to 12 months, like I have had numerous conversations with people that were terrified that they had accidentally done this. All right, I don't know if I've committed this unforgivable sin. Even the name of it sounds terrible, right? It's like unscratchable itch. Like, I don't want that at all. Whatever, however I get that, I don't want that. And, um, and, but listen, God's love drives out fear of condemnation and punishment. And where God's love resides, there can be no fear of condemnation and punishment. So we need to resolve this, right? What is the unforgivable sin? How do I not do that? So I don't have to even worry about it. And the, un- the, the unforgivable sin comes from something that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 12. He's being attacked by the religious leaders. They saw, and, and they're saying that Jesus is working with Satan, with the fallen angels, to lead people away from God. All right? And so that's their message to the people is that, no, Jesus is in league. He's working with Satan, against God. Don't follow him. And Jesus replies in verses 30 through 32, of Matthew 12, he says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, that's Jesus, will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. What is that talking about? Like that, That's some serious language that Jesus is using. And, and, and it's tricky for us because there's not like a clear explanation given. Sometimes when Jesus would teach in parables and the disciples would get all confused, they would, they would pull him aside later and be like, we are so lost, help us. And Jesus would kind of give them the backstory and he would explain what he meant. That doesn't happen here. Jesus, he just drops this unforgivable sin and, and moves on. But the context helps us. And some other scripture helps us connect the dots. So let me give us the bottom line, and then I'll unpack uh, the explanation of it. The bottom line is the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is this, to know the truth of the gospel and to reject it. To know the truth of the gospel and reject it. The Holy Spirit's role in this world and in our life is to point to Jesus, to reveal to us the truth of the gospel of Jesus our need for forgiveness. And if we reject that work of the Spirit, then we cannot be forgiven. Right? You're following the sequence here. If we we receive the truth from God, from the Spirit, and then we reject that and we never accept Jesus, then by default we cannot be forgiven because we have not accepted God's means of forgiveness. It is an unforgivable sin to reject Christ. Now, for the religious leaders of their day, we know that they, they knew who Jesus was. All right, we read in John chapter 3, um, it says, uh, a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling councils, right? So he was in the group that was attacking Jesus in Matthew 12. He says, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. No one could perform the signs you're doing if, they, if God were not with him. All right, listen, we know you're from God. We know that what you're saying, your message is from God. They should have believed. They should have trusted. They should have followed Jesus, but they rejected him out of jealousy, out of you know, maintaining their place of power in the community. For us, it might be that person who's gone to church. Maybe they grew up in a, in a, 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 a Christian family. They know the truth of Jesus, and they say no thanks. And they live the rest of their life rejecting Jesus. Or maybe it's the person who, in their darkest, most painful experience, encountered Jesus. God showed up for them. And he's, with that invitation of forgiveness and healing and hope, but they hardened their heart. And they said, nope. And they never trusted in Jesus. 
to reject the truth of Jesus. Whatever the circumstance, the unforgivable sin requires awareness and intentionality. You cannot accidentally do this, right? You can't wake up, it's Tuesday, oops, I committed the unforgivable sin. That doesn't happen that way. It has to be this conscious, willful choice to reject Jesus. And so the love of God, as we've experienced his forgiveness and his love, we can be secure that, that we have not, because we have accepted Jesus. And so we can live in that, in that um, awareness of God's love and that security with him. So where does all of this leave us? Well, first of all, for those who have never put your trust in Jesus, you got to understand that your debt, the offense that you owe God is outstanding. That debt is still owed. That penalty still needs to be paid. And God, being the merciful master that he is from the parable, he has provided a way for every person's debt to be written off, to be covered, to be canceled through Jesus. And it's simply a matter of acknowledging the debt that you owe God, that that you owe that debt. And you believe, because he says it, that that debt can be forgiven through Jesus. Because Jesus died for you, because he was risen from the dead, and that he lives today. And as you confess these things to God, communicate to him, you're, you acknowledge in your belief and, and, and asking for that forgiveness, immediately and fully and completely, God will forgive. That debt can be written off, and you can leave this room or wherever you're watching this with a clean slate and a new life. Will you accept that invitation today? For those who have trusted in Jesus, you've been forgiven. Are you living the life of a forgiver? Is there anyone in your life that you need to either openly forgive or just within your own heart and mind forgive and release and let that go? Is there someone that you've forgiven but you haven't reconciled with, that you're not at peace with them? Do you need to take that step? Or maybe God is prompting you to go that extra step and restore that relationship. It's like, yeah, you know, we wave, but we, we really should be friends again. And again, we've already said that's not always the right step to take. That can be a hard thing to figure out. And if you're wrestling with that, then definitely seek godly counsel. Someone you trust in the Lord, uh, reach out to us here at the church. And like, hey, just help me think this through. Should I restore this relationship? But God calls us to be forgivers. You see, we're living in death and darkness without God's forgiveness in our lives. And then we're living in a shadow of the goodness that he wants us to know when we withhold forgiveness. So let's let's just decide. We want to live in the full light of God. I want to be forgiven, and I want to forgive others. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your love and your grace, Lord, that you even make forgiveness an option for us with the mountain of offense that that we owe you, that you have made a way for us to be forgiven. Father, help us to to live in that. God, I pray for anyone who, who still owes you that debt. Lord, may they hear loud and clear from your spirit this morning that that invitation to be forgiven, that they can place their faith and trust in Jesus and they begin that new life in you. And God, help us to know and to learn more and more how to be forgivers that we can extend that forgiveness that you have given us. It's hard for us. We, we, we're much more prone to anger and bitterness and, and just withholding forgiveness. So God, work in us and teach us and show, shape us. And God, I, I, do, I just want to acknowledge that I, I, I'm sure some here are hurting deeply from things that have been done or said to them. And God, I pray that you would bring healing to their hearts and to their minds. And God, in that healing, that you can bring them to that point of forgiveness. And we praise you for your greatness in all these things. Amen. Amen.